Kuwait in crisis. The country holds its second parliamentary elections this year, but opposition groups say they won't stand by the outcome, putting them back on a collision course with the ruling family. This is Inside Story. Hello again, I'm James Bays. Kuwait's political divisions look to be growing ever wider. Even as a new parliament is being formed, opposition groups are promising to bring it down. They say they'll continue protesting until it's abolished. Members of Kuwait's opposition boycotted Saturday's poll. They're angry at a decree by the emir that they say changed voting laws to favour pro-government candidates. It means they now have no representatives in the 50-seat parliament. The oil-rich nation has been shaken by a series of political crises that have stalled development and investment, and it's facing unprecedented protests as voices from the street draw inspiration from the Arab Spring. For Inside Story, Caroline Malone has our report. A door of opportunity to vote in Kuwait's second parliamentary election this year has closed. A good proportion of people didn't turn up, but exactly how many is debatable. The government says voter turnout was good, but the opposition disagrees, arguing most eligible voters held back. According to our information, more than 80% of the Kuwaiti people have boycotted these elections. We have passed by the polling stations and found them empty. Kuwaitis are refusing such an assembly and will start working from today to topple it and will not accept it either socially or politically. Polling station in areas loyal to the government may well have seen high turnout, while those in opposition areas did not. That's because opposition candidates withdrew from the race after a new voting system came into force six weeks ago. They say it makes it easier for pro-government candidates to win. Either way, some candidates just want to move on. We should make the new election process successful and move on from the instability of the country to stability with a new program for the new government and to submit it to the National Assembly. There should be cooperation with strict monitoring by the Assembly on the incoming government. Meanwhile, there's been a movement of orange opposition on the streets. The latest was a peaceful gathering of at least 15,000 people. There have been regular protests since a court annulled the result of February's election. Opposition candidates with views ranging from liberal to conservative did well in that one. This may be the second election this year, but it's no closer to uniting the nation. Caroline Malone, Al Jazeera. So can Kuwait resolve its political crisis? For more on this, I'm joined by our panel of three experts. From Kuwait City, we have Fahad Shulami, a security analyst and former Kuwaiti army colonel. From Beirut, Joseph Kisheshian, an independent Middle East analyst and a columnist for Gulf News. And also from Kuwait City by Skype, Salam al Ghodari, Deputy Secretary of the Civil Democratic Movement of Kuwait. Can I start with you, please, uh, Fahad, and can you tell me how serious is the current crisis? Uh, thank you, but uh, let me, before I, I, I answer this, I just want to mention a few good points in my opinion. 65%, this is the new, the new, the, the, the new percentage of the new faces who will uh, be on the National Assembly. Uh, this is the first time since Kuwait uh, legislation on 1963 where a lady on a, a tribal district has got a chair in the Kuwaiti parliament. Uh, three ladies were in the parliament. We did not uh, see any sub-tribal uh, election or minor election before the election, which is against the law. Uh, uh, penalties and, and calls for uh, uh, voting buying is only five, comparing with the 2011 last election, 45 uh, call uh, about vote buying. Okay, for you, you've made that uh, you've made those points, but there is still a crisis here, isn't there? The opposition completely boycotted this election. How bad and how serious is that crisis? Uh, 
I, I think uh, we carry a great respect for the opposition. Uh, there are uh, political figures from them. Uh, but I, I, th I think they were hasty a little bit in making the decision of boycotting the election. They used their last uh, option on the, on the beginning. It must be, uh, I think uh, they, they lost some of the judgment in using this last option. Uh, a wisdom uh, needs to be taken uh, in consider when you deal with the election and boycotting, especially the words boycotting. Uh, that's why they left behind and uh, there is a new National Assembly with a 40% turnout uh, heading to a new future. OK, if I can bring uh, Salam in, who's joining us by Skype from Kuwait City. I think it's worth mentioning we did book a studio for you, Salam, in uh, Kuwait City. But then the yeah. uh, studio phoned back, asked what the subject was. And when we told them the subject, the studio was then unavailable. Viewers can draw their own conclusions to that. Can you tell me, Salam, some people are saying that this is the worst crisis Kuwait has faced since the 2nd of August 1990, when Saddam Hussein invaded your country. Do you agree with that assessment? Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, about this uh, uh, interview. Uh, let me uh, just uh, briefly talk about the percentages of uh, the election held uh, yesterday. Uh, actually, today we have uh, among our um, movement, 60 of our representatives uh, been uh, uh, observing the election and it turned out that our number shows that only 34 percent of the total electors or the voters in kuwait have participated in this election so technically speaking the minority we are seeing today is in the parliament it is not the majority OK, so we don't well, think Fah Fahad, is, yes. Fahad obviously is going to dispute those figures. I'd like to come back to the turnout a little later. But a general answer first. How serious is the crisis facing your country, please? We have uh, uh, a very severe crisis in terms of the political representation. We have, as a political movement, presented our proposal into uh, the major political reforms which is an elected government and a party authorization, a political party authorization, and a singular district uh, voting uh, system. Uh, also, uh, a uh, proportional party list representation uh, in the government. Uh, also, uh, the last point of our uh, proposal was uh, the uh, election commission, which must be independent from any government intervention. OK, thank you for that, so Joseph. Without, jo if I can bring Joseph is in now, who's not in Kuwait City, he's in Beirut. He, for the purposes of this discussion, I hope, will be a neutral analyst. Joseph, how serious is the situation facing this small emirate? This is a classic constitutional dilemma that Kuwait has been facing ever since it's gained its independence back in 1961. Nothing really that much, uh, nothing has changed that much ever since that time. We have periodically these kinds of events going on whereby a power struggle is underway between the Al Sabah ruling family and parliamentarians who have, during the past 50 years or so, really gotten a taste of what constitutional monarchy is all about. But of course, Kuwait is not a constitutional monarchy. It is still an absolute monarchy, which is the reason why we have these periodic crises where parliamentarians who are duly elected, even if the numbers are small of those participating in the election, nevertheless, these are historically legitimate elections. And therefore, when parliamentarians speak and ask questions of ministers and government officials, they really want to have answers. Sometimes these are embarrassing and the government officials don't want to address them. That is the reason why we have these periodic crises.
OK, Joseph, we have viewers all over the world, not all of them following the twists and turns of what's going on in Kuwait. So let's give us a little bit of context now. Let's look at how the political system in Kuwait is structured. The Emir Sheikh Sabah al Ahmed al Sabah is head of state and head of the Sabah ruling family. He appoints the Prime Minister, currently Sheikh Jabba al Mubarak al Sabah, and the Prime Minister in turn appoints the 15 members of the cabinet. Most of the top ministers are held by members of the Sabah family. Moving on, on to Kuwait's parliament, the National Assembly. That's what the election on Saturday was for. It's made up of 50 seats split equally among five districts. Kuwait doesn't allow political parties, they're banned, so people form loose alliances based on their politics and religious and family ties. Back to you, Joseph. Basically, it's a clash between the elected parliament and the cabinet, which is appointed and appointed by the, the ruling family. Is that right? And you left out something very important, whereby the ruler, the emir, can actually abolish parliament whenever he feels there is a crisis. And he has done that several times, most importantly in 1976 and, of course, in 2000. And after, in 2000, the crisis was really serious because the elections were not scheduled uh, until three years later, which means there was a, a real gap of three years where he ruled by decree, which according to the Constitution of Kuwait, the ruler must not do. Nevertheless, today we have a classic power struggle whereby the ruler wants to really push his agenda through and he does not want to stand, to stand for any kind of criticism which parliamentarians reject in toto. What's important this time around, beyond the numbers and beyond what the a ruler himself may have wished to do and beyond the boycott is that in the result we have for the first time 17 elected officials who happen to be Shia among the 50 elected officials and this is the highest number that the Shia have ever managed to assume the highest previous to this was 10 so you're talking about something that will change dramatically the makeup of the parliament and of course it will have repercussions throughout the region and that's because the shia didn't boycott uh, the election as as many of the opposition did fahad if i can bring exactly, you yes. in uh, i read a quote today from yes. one political science professor in kuwait who said the people of kuwait have outgrown certain elements of their constitution is it time for a change to the whole system yes. Yes, I think, I think we, need, we, we need to do some changes. But I just want to respond to Joseph, honestly. Uh, all what he said was in the Kuwaiti constitution. It was approved uh, in, 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 in Kuwait constitution, either the, the, the Emir rights to uh, dissolve the parliament, and in, in, in 60 days the parliament will, uh, either we have a new election or the parliament will come back by the constitution also. Also, uh, I think giving the Shia is not a negative. Why, 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 why are people participated in an election and, and, and they won? Uh, and I'll give you an example from that history. The Sunni in Iraq, they boycotting the first election and they lost. Second election, they were on board. And now they are part, uh, part uh, a big part in the government or in the parliament. So uh, I think it's not, it's not, it's not that uh, side. Uh, wh what I want to comment in is since 2003 until 2011, uh, there is a conflict between uh, uh, the National Assembly and the government. Yes, I, I agree. That is, we have a corruption. Yes, I agree. We have a low performance of many governments. Yes. But also, we have a tense and we have uh, 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 sometimes overreacting, overusing the, the authority of, of, or the power of the uh, MP over ministers, uh, misusing of authority. I think both sides are carrying the same mistakes, but in different directions. What is the answer? The answer, yes. We need to do some uh, uh, political changes, legislative uh, change, uh, changes through uh, the National Assembly and the government. Cooperation. That is what the citizens want. Most of the people who went outside to the street, they did not went to uh, uh, demonstrate against uh, uh, the Emir of Kuwait or against the regime. They want uh, uh, changes in the government performance 
also, also the National Assembly is a big partner with the government. Uh, people okay. are asking if for I can housing get in there, projects. Fahad. If I can get in there, because we need to, Fahad, we need to let everyone, we, we need to have, let everyone have a say. And I'd, you say both sides are to blame. I'd like to bring in Salim on that in a moment. But let just bring our viewers up to speed a little bit more on the background. The Arab Spring created new momentum and calls for political freedom across the Arab world. The first street demonstrations demanding reforms in Kuwait took place in March 2011. By November, the numbers had swelled to more than 50,000, forcing the Emir to act. He replaced the Prime Minister, but the new PM was, as is always the case, another member of the ruling family. The government then resigned, and weeks later, Parliament was dissolved. Parliamentary elections in February resulted in an opposition landslide. Come June, though, the Constitutional Court declared those polls illegal and reinstated the previous parliament that had generally backed the ruling family. And by October, the Emir dissolved this reinstated parliament, although it never met, and made a controversial change to the voting law. Which brings us to Saturday's elections and the opposition boycott over that amendment. Salem, we've heard this, the, the, all the events that have taken place in just a year, it seems, a really eventful year in Kuwait. Who's to blame for this crisis? Actually, we, we have, uh, as Joseph said, uh, uh, a systematic or a structural problem in the Constitution. Uh, this is what we are proposing to change. We need a grand reforms in order to have a smooth political life which carries out the hopes of the Kuwaiti people and advance the Kuwaiti people into a new future. This is the clash which started in 19, since 1965, where the government comes in and tries to um, somehow manipulate the election results. This is a classical, um, uh, uh, cyclic uh, issues. In every election, it happens. Now, OK, OK. Can I, can I stop without, you there, Salem? Because I do think yes. what our viewers need to know, you say what's wrong with the system. What system do you want in its place? Would you like a European-style constitutional monarchy as in the UK or the Netherlands or, or the Nordic countries? What do you want? We are proposing, as we stated uh, a year back, uh, an elected government has to be elected through a party list with a proportional representation and a singular district of voting and also this will give everybody the right for representation what we see today is a minority becoming the major legislature of the country okay i want and you've explained it there i want fahad's response please fahad what do you think of that? I just want to ask Salem, who will, who will oppose the changes for or, or some changes in the Kuwaiti constitution? Is it the government or, or the uh, opposition now? They said everything else except the constitution. That was the address has been raised. No true. changes for That's the constitution. Mr. Ali Al Rashid, Mr. Ali Al Rashid. He asked for a minor changes in the constitution, and everybody in the, on, on the opposition stand against him. So please, yeah, uh, these things needs to be discussed in 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 a, in, in, in a matter of uh, neutrality. Opposition, Absolutely. the people who will oppose Absolutely. that new changes to the to the constitution. Go ahead, Salam. Exactly. Uh, Historically, that's just me, Dave. If you please let me uh, uh, respond to that. Historically, uh, since the last uh, last year, we, our proposal has been announced, and what we see today that all the opposition leaders in the uh, in the parliament has is carrying our ideas and carrying our uh, principal changes uh, to the constitution. Um, this is the exit from this political turmoil. Other than that, we are going into a cyclic. Why? Problem. Why they carry this, uh, uh, these, these theories this is... or these uh, proposals? You know why? Because they lost their four votes. They do not want the one-vote man. Uh, that's why they 
they jump up to a constitutional monarchy, uh, a constitutional government, uh, an, an, an elected government, then it has been forgotten. When okay, they Fahad, the four I think I need to jump and, in and there. To I, need the, to think uh, I need to jump in there just to explain that to our viewers. Voters used to get four votes uh, for their four favourite candidates. It's now been turned into a, a one-vote system. Joseph, in most countries, democracy campaigners are arguing for one person, one vote, aren't they? Well, you just uh, witnessed the dilemma that the Kuwaiti public faces between two very strong arguments. What is the solution when you are faced with such an intractable situation? I think that neither side is going to be able to actually push through whatever agenda item they have. There's got to be some kind of an interim solution. And there is one, actually, not just applicable to Kuwait, but throughout the region, throughout the Gulf countries, whereby the rulers, the emirs, or the kings, or the sultans, will actually allow that the prime minister be elected by either the Majlis al-Ummah, like in uh, Kuwait, or Majlis al-Shura elsewhere, whereby you have some kind of accountability to an elected prime minister that will leave the government and perhaps over a period of several years, a new amendment or several amendments to the constitution could be devised to actually allow for this kind of power struggle not to be repeated every time there is a political crisis. Joseph, can I, ju can I just bring in another factor in all this? Our viewers are watching this. We're talking about a tiny country called Kuwait, but remind us of the strategic importance of Kuwait, about its geographical position and its position in terms of its energy resources. Oh, a sandwich between Iraq on the north and Saudi Arabia in the south and jutting into the Persian Gulf, holding 10% of the world's oil resources. Kuwait is one of the most strategic countries in the, on the entire Arabian Peninsula. Uh, let us not forget that hegemons throughout the region, whether it is Iraq or Iran or others, have always maintained a great deal of interest. And this is a country that has been claimed by Iraq, not just under Saddam Hussein in 1990, but all the way back in 1961, when Qasem of Iraq threatened to invade as well. And let's not forget that the United States, according to the United Nations resolutions, uh, put together a major armada to actually go there and liberate uh, Kuwait from, uh, from Iraq after the invasion. So therefore, this is one of the most strategically located countries throughout the region. Fahad, can I ask you, how much is the political problems holding back your country? It's been said to me that Kuwait City, when you compare it with maybe Doha in Qatar or the cities of UAE, uh, Dubai uh, or Abu Dhabi, it looks like a city from the 1970s. Would you agree with that? Uh, James, the most important is that we live in a region. We have to understand we are surrounded with a monarchy system in all over the region except Iraq and except Iran. Uh, and, and we are affected. We are part of the GCC. So any major decisions needs to be uh, coordinated and, need, uh, and, uh, and, and needs to be taken wisely because it will affect our coalition, it will affect the Saudi, it will affect the United Arab Emirates. So yes, I agree with you, uh, we, we were a little bit behind. But if you go to the political t culture of the Kuwaiti society, we are a very rich society. And uh, another two points, I, I really no, we I have a comment. We don't have another two, we don't have, we, we, we don't have time for another two points, I'm afraid, because I do want to get Salam in before the end of the show. Salam, the opposition are outside the parliament. In some ways, maybe they might have shot themselves in the foot, because what do they do until another election in four years' time? Briefly, tell me what happens now. Uh, currently, all the oppo opposition parties and uh, groups, um, we are in the civil democratic movement, uh, proposing uh, a national um, uh, gathering to put together the future of the Kuwait political system. Uh, this is as per our proposal. Um, we in Kuwait, I just want to uh, you know, go back to the point, Kuwait is a leader in the political um, life system among the region. And uh, we see that Kuwait will be also the leader in the future for all uh, life aspects.
if we implement the right system which will carry out the hopes and the dreams of the Kuwaiti people. Other than that, we will end up into minorities only caring about their own um, uh, self and self-interest and removing the public interest. Salam, thank you. Thanks to all our guests, Fahad Shalemi in Kuwait City, Joseph Kasheshian in Beirut, and via Skype also from Kuwait City, Salam al Gadori. A lively discussion and one on which, as ever, we would like your views. The way to get in touch with us is Inside Story at aljazeera.net. Tell us what you think we should discuss too on our next show. Thank you for watching. I'll see you very soon.